welcome everyone. We'll give it one more minute as people are joining. <clears throat> Good to see so many friendly faces. Welcome. All right, we will get started. Welcome everyone. This is our uh, 11th Fourth Tuesday Forum on Innovative Options. I'm Elisa Blardo, Deputy Commissioner uh, for the Department of Developmental Services, and I, I welcome you all here today. Um, we have uh, a great uh, lineup today, some excellent presenters that will be sharing information with you. Um, I wanted to make you aware that uh, this session is being recorded. Um, so if you do not wish to be recorded, you can put any um, questions or comments in the, the chat and keep your uh, camera off, but um, we do record these sessions and we will post it on our website uh, for people who are unable to attend today so that they have the opportunity to have access to the information. Um, today's topic is, get it exactly, children, services, and transition age youth. And um, we have, a, um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, a number of presentations today. There are folks, folks from DDS that will be presenting. We have um, a private provider, and we have um, uh, uh, two family members, and we have our colleague from uh, BRS. So we've got a great lineup of uh, presentations. And our hope is to really share uh, the range of children's services that we have, that we offer uh, throughout DDS. And, um, and we'll do that um, kind of chronologically. So we'll start um, uh, uh, with people that are entering uh, DDS services, and then uh, we'll bring you right through the transition into adult services. So um, we do hold all questions until the end uh, because we want to get through each of the presentations. But if you have a question um, as somebody's presenting, feel free to uh, write it in the chat. And then as uh, the presentations come to a close, uh, we'll turn it over to questions and answers. We'll refer to the questions that are in the chat, or you can raise your hand at that time and just ask your question. All right. So. And now I'd like to uh, introduce Tanya McNair. Tanya is the IFS Director of S Services and Supports for the West Region, and she's going to share a little information about um, our DDS helpline and IFS services, individual and family support services. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm just going to come on camera real quick um, so you can have a face to go with the name. Um, and then I'm going to share my screen to tell you a little bit about um, IFS in the helpline. Okay, can you can you all see my screen? We can. Great. And it, can I ask that people mute themselves if they're not uh, speaking? Thank you. Okay. So yes, my name is um, Tonya McNear. I'm the director of the West Region Helpline. And I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about the helpline um, and how the helpline um, is part of the individual um, and family supports that DDS provides um, to people that live in the community. So as you know, the Department of Developmental Services is broken up into three regions. Um, there are, um, one helpline in each region to support families. And here you see a basic map of the different regions and how they're divided up. So what is the helpline? Well, the helpline services individuals, um, youth um, that are not on Husky C, not on the waiver. And the helplines were created in 2009. Since then, the helplines have grown tremendously 
Um, there's approximately 2,000 individuals and families served within the helplines. Um, on this slide, you can see the phone number to each helpline and the email address. So what happens? How does a person get referred to the helpline? Well, basically, um, an individual is made eligible um, at central office with our eligibility division. When they're made eligible, their file is forwarded to the region where they reside. The helpline directors are the el eligibility liaisons for each region. When we receive the file for the individual, we send out a welcoming packet welcoming the person to the region. Families are welcome to call. When you're made eligible, you receive a letter from the eligibility division um, asking you to please allow approximately two weeks for your file to make it to the regional office, and then you're free um, to call for services. So who means the helpline? Um, currently, there are three helpline case managers per region and a director. And so the helpline and the director work together to provide services to families. And there's several things that we do. Um, the helpline case manager basically is your primary point of contact when you're when you're first made eligible. And so you, if you need services, if you reach out to inquire for services or to seek services, you will be assigned a helpline case manager. The helpline case managers primarily work with individuals um, who do not have Husky C. Um, so we work primarily with children who are under the age of 18. The helpline case managers are responsible for doing your initial um, guardianship. So when your child is approaching the age of 18, um, there's several different um, services that the helpline case manager provides. One, we send out a letter um, letting you know that um, your child is approaching 18 and informing you of the next steps. At this point, we introduce you to the transition advisor and to the other services and supports that are going to be necessary. And we provide all of the referrals that you may need. Uh, we help you with guardianships. Um, we help assisting families um, with camp grants, family grants, SDE grants. Um, if you're interested in respite stay, we assist with that. Um, we also help you um, with consultative services through our resource team. Our resource team is comprised of several professionals that provide a variety of different services. We have, um, we have our respite centers that we provide um, referrals to. We also have Camp Harkness. We have family grants and we have um, a psychologist. We have a behaviorist, occupational therapist, speech therapist, and nursing. And all of these supports you can access through your helpline case manager through a referral process that we have. So our referrals are both within the department. We also make recommendations um, to other providers in the community. So say, for example, you call and based on the description of what's happening with your child, we may recommend um, a referral to Carolyn yeah. or to CFC. OK. And so what happens with the helpline? If you call, sometimes families call because they just have a basic question, and sometimes they call because they're in crisis or there's an emergency. The helpline responds by triaging and following through on any emergency situations. We work collaboratively with the public and with public providers and private providers to help meet the needs of everyone who calls the helpline. We assist families with connecting with others and we assist them with giving them guidance for the next steps. For example, 
if your child was made eligible for DDS prior to the age of eight, they will need to be re redetermined at the age of eight and the helpline assists you with that redetermination. Um, we send out letters notifying you that your child needs to be redetermined and then we guide you through the process. We also do this when your child is 17 years old and now they're approaching the age where they're going to need to apply for Social Security, they're going to need to apply for Husky C, they're going to need guardianship. And we assist with that process. We walk you through that. We complete all initial guardianships, which is basically the first guardianship that will be done with your child for you to um, be able to assist them after they turn 18 years old. We also assist with Husky C if you need assistance doing the application or following up with DSS, we also assist with that. We work collaboratively with our waiver unit um, involving Husky C applications. We're also responsible for three-year guardianships, which after your initial guardianship, every three years um, per probate court, per the law, you have to do a new guardianship and we assist with that. And we basically assist with any services you need, any referrals or any assistance that you need or connect you with the appropriate parties while your child is still with the helpline. So when is your child transferred? So basically, when your child has Husky C, it's confirmed that they want a waivered service such as a day program, and your child is approaching um, exiting school, approximately about a year before your child exits school is when we would start trans um, start the process of transferring your child to a, to a traditional case manager. So as you see, your child can be with the helpline um, for, for many years. So if your child was made eligible at eight years old, they can be with the helpline up until um, they're about 21 years old. So that is all I have. Uh, I did have a questions page, um, but I will save that to the end. Thank you so much, Tanya. Um, I, as you were presenting, uh, we realized some people joined a little late, um, mm -hmm. so I will. So I will. Um, some people logged on uh, to a, uh, another link, and so hopped over a little bit late. So I just want to share this meeting is being recorded. So if you missed the first few minutes, um, the recording will be posted on our website under Fourth Tuesday Forums. In fact, the recordings to all of the Fourth Tuesday Forums are are on that website. Um, and we are holding the questions to the end. So if you have a question, feel free to drop it in the chat or um, you can ask the question at the end. Um, but welcome to all of you who have joined a little uh, a little late. Um, thank you so much, Tanya. That was really informative. And um, and so now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Tammy Benegay, our director of uh, Children's Services. We'll talk a little bit about um, centralized children's services for DDS. Welcome, Tammy. Hi, everybody. Tanya, I think you can stop sharing. Otherwise, people are seeing people a couple of times. Um, I do not have a PowerPoint. Um, I was just going to talk. But um, we are at a very exciting time here at DDS. We are centralizing children's services. So all children's services are going to be in one unit with uh, case managers who are going to understand kids and, and uh, specialize in kids and work with families. So it's a very exciting time. Um, DDS does have a behavior services program for kids that have um, significant behavioral health needs and the families would like in-home supports and help with, uh, with behavior plans and supports that could go into the family home um, to um, really give ideas, provide respite, um, and encourage families and the individual to uh, not encourage them, but uh, how to how to better calm down the situation if uh, the behaviors are more out of control. We also, um, with our helpline, 
work very collaboratively with voluntary care management. So kids that have mental health issues, uh, we will help the family make a referral to voluntary care management um, so the family can get support through that service. We work collaboratively with our local school systems, with the State Department of Education, with DCF, with Carolyn Autism Services, and like I said, voluntary care management. So we really are able to integrate all those services to best support a family and then work together to transition a child into adult services. So I think that's one thing that we're able to do very, very well. Um, with centralizing children's services, it gives us an advantage uh, to know families, for families to get to know us and have those children's services centralized with a single point of contact for those supports and services. So it will be a really strong partnership with the helpline to talk about those kids that may be coming to other services. And it really will be a nice partnership with our external um, agencies to know where to call and to know who to contact within our agency to talk about what might be available for children. Um, so this is a centralizing kids is new to DDS. So we're just getting it off the ground. I'm very, very excited about it. And um, we'll probably be talking to many people on how to make sure we're doing this well and we are meeting the needs of families. Um, I think that covers what we're doing with children's services and all the different parts. Elisa, did you want me to talk about anything else specific about children's services? No, I no, I think that was a great overview. And I think our next presenter will actually um, kind of show uh, what yes. some of these services look like. And so um, I think, um, I think it's going to uh, really kind of paint the picture. So, Nicole, are you with us? I am. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hi, Nicole. Um, I, hi, I, hi, Nicole. Um, Nicole DeRoche at um, Edelbrook, and I'm sorry if I did not pronounce your last uh, name correctly, um, is going to share a little bit about Children's Respite. Uh, the Linda Riley Blue Respite Center opened over this past year, and Nicole um along with jody are going to share a little bit about um what uh, what the respite center has to offer welcome thank you hi everybody my name is nicole um and i i we've partnered with dds for a really exciting program that we've opened in enfield um due to the overwhelming need for respite services with kids and the BSP program. Um, we did open on november 4th and since then we've had um kids who families who need respite services so you know a break family that need to travel for a wedding or a vacation um, come to our services um, located in Enfield we provide respite for um, kids aged 8 to 21 um, both genders so we try to we keep it gender specific for the weekends um, but the criteria for the kids coming to respite services are that they have BSP services um, through DDS, they have some sort of developmental disability or autism, um, and our staff is highly trained in providing the total care that those um, kiddos need um, throughout their stay with us. Um, we're open Friday um, at about noon till Monday at noon, um, and again, we we provide care for for kids um, needing respite. So it's a really exciting new program that we have, um, and it's yeah, really for him. This is why I was asking also about the. <laughs> um, so we really, you know, have it kind of catered to the kids, each kid's needs. Um, we like to do as many activities as we can based on what kids are capable or what their interests are. We tailor each weekend to um, the specific kids that are there. So if some kids, you know, are more homebodies and they prefer to stay in and do crafts or baking activities. So we make sure to group those kids together. Whereas some of our other kids like to go out in the community and, you know, go bowling or go mini golfing or um, Edelbrook has a splash pad that we've recently opened up. So we're talking about using the aquatic screener to have kids go 
to our splash pad, um, things that they prefer to do. So it's really a no demand environment. Um, um, I think there's, oh, there we go. <laughs> so um, in, most of the kids have a really good time and we've had very few issues behaviorally, but you know, the behavioral complexities of the kids are very high. So, you know, we do have some, um, some behaviors in the, in the program, but our staff are highly trained on how to manage that, um, you know, using interpersonal de-escalation and um, things of that nature. So it's a really exciting program. Um, and again, you know, we, we're very excited to have partnered with DDS to, to provide this. I don't know if Jody is on, um, he is a parent that um, has, um, his son has been to the program several times, but I am going to show you guys just a, a small PowerPoint, um, just of some pictures of the program so you can get a feel. Can you guys see um, my screen okay? We can. Okay. Okay. So let's see if that'll work. Okay, so this is the front of the house. This was kind of around the time we opened. Um, you can see there's cobwebs there. Our staff were there around Halloween. Um, so this is our staff in front of the house. They were very excited about the opening. Um, and these are some pictures of our kids um, doing some activities in the program. <clears throat> They do lots of arts and crafts, especially since we opened in the winter, we've had to be very creative with, you know, in-home activities. Uh, but now that it's been so nice out, we've been doing a lot outdoors. Um, this is the kitchen. It's a very beautiful house. We're very lucky to have such a nice space. Um, this is the living room. And we've, you know, purchased a lot of um, activities for the kids to, to participate in, which they enjoy. This is our sensory wall, which um, provides our kids with sensory stimulation, um, you know, throughout the day. A lot of kids like to flip the light switches or play the xylophone or, you know, play with the Velcro, feel the little grassy areas on the wall. Um, and these are some of the bedrooms. So we can hold up to four kids every weekend. So we've kind of designed each room to be a different theme. This is the crayon room and this is our solar system room. This is our aquatic room. Oops. And that's that's pretty much the house. The house also has a um, a very nice backyard um, where we're able. It's very big um, area. We're in a very rural setting, so it's it's nice for the kids to be able to walk. Um, a lot of the kids like to hike or bike, so we've been able to do a lot of things like that. So. Um, and I'm not sure if Jody has joined since I started talking, but um, Jody, are you there? No, I don't see her um, on the participant list, but um, I do see uh, Sabrina and um, yeah, Alicia. Did you have anything that you wanted to add? So Nicole, I'm sorry your parent isn't isn't available, but I will share that this has been a huge, huge gift of families who are absolutely looking for just a little bit of support and, you know, they, they don't get somebody to come and relieve them um, shift after shift. They're on 24-7, 365. Um, and I'll, I'll just share this. The reason it's named Linda Riley Blue, I don't think, Nicole, you said this, but um, it is named after a board member of ours who had adopted nine young men with autism in her life. And this was her biggest passion as a board member was saying respite was so important to her being able to be successful with her family. She wanted to make sure respite was available to other families. So um, the house is affectionately named after her and it's, it's a really wonderful, um, I think for parents, they told us it's a gift to them. I, Nicole gets many emails after, um, weekends but um, they just feel like this is such a relief to them and to note and to be able to look forward to maybe every six months having that opportunity has been really important and i did just speak with jody he's trying to log on right now so hopefully oh there he is there you go <laughs> hi jody hi jody are you welcome did you, were you able to get in hi yeah how you doing all right, there he is. 
Hi, Jody. I just kind of gave a little rundown of, of the respite program. So if you want to share some of your, you know, feedback, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think the first time we went in, it was, was in October maybe or September timeframe. I think we were one of the first folks to use respite and uh, geez, uh, you know, I just remember the relief I felt the first time. Like I, I was, I mean, I have to say like a little nerve, a little bit nervous because I'm like, never met you all before. You know, we had talked, I can't remember the lady's name. We had some virtual tour, a uh, Nicole predecessor and uh, I had a vibe. Um, but it's just, you know, you're just always on as a parent of a special needs child. You're always on. And, um, and you really feel pretty much alone, like you're a pioneer. Depending, even though we have all kinds of research and all this other stuff, um, there's very, very few people, family and friends included, that we feel can handle him and can watch him. And some of those people have left the area you know, over time. And, and so, you know, uh, what's ironic about it is when I first heard about respite, uh, Tina Sousa from BDS, who's actually left the position just about a month ago, unfortunately, um, I didn't know how it was going to be. I mean, she was helping us with respite, not only in the house, but elsewhere. And, and I actually said, no, I'm like, I just wasn't feeling comfortable. So I understand for any parents out there that don't, um, that get a little nervous about it. I was there too. And, and I'm like, you know, I, I was so used to being like a helicopter parent watching every moment of every second. And, um, you know, I, I just, uh, it was a, definitely a leap of faith, you know, at the first time, like, again, we had never met Genesis and um, Chrissy, I think. And I'm like, all right, said a little prayer, <laughs> you know, uh, hopefully this isn't a bad move, you know, but um, it was, I just remember driving home. It's about an hour and 20 minutes uh, from where I live to, to um, Edelbrook. And, uh, you know, my daughter's seven and I was able to have like a daddy daughter weekend with her and just, you know, just, it was all her, you know, and uh, she's her. Her life has been very blessed in, in a lot of ways. But in other ways, it's been tough because we're always focused on each other. So th there's been it's provided not only relief uh, for for me, which um, you know has been helped very very helpful at times, but it's also allowed me to focus on my daughter to have some time with her at, at, when I usually can't do that, you know. And so um, and I just you know it's it's funny. Uh, um, I always feel like I get, I'll say two more things. Um, at the very beginning, I was like, can we do a Zoom? And so I was doing like three Zooms per day, I think, you know, for Saturday and Sunday. Uh, I think the staff had kind of used their own phone. You know, I was calling um, because I was just like, I don't know them. They don't really know me. They don't really, they're learning EJ, you know? And um, so, and then, you know, I think that they have also been good, like, oh, Oh, we're going to take them to the mall. We're going to take them to bowling. And I'm like, awesome. Like about a month ago, I think they took them and they were to a local park and there was a baseball game playing. And so uh, they're doing crafts with him and, and stuff that just, you know, crafts just isn't in me. Like you know, I take them to parks, we go running, we play basketball, we do all kinds of stuff. I'm just not going to do crafts with them. I'm sorry. You know, and so when they're, when they're, oh, here's what he made. I'm like thrilled, you know, so there's been a lot. And I asked, and I, I think I shared this with Nicole before. I've asked him every single time, EJ, do you want to go to Edelbrook this weekend or do you want to stay home? 100% of the time, he chooses Edelbrook. 100% of the time. And, you know, sometimes he'll give us, like, he'll, he used to say yes a lot, like 99% of the time, for even when the, the correct answer is no. Uh, he's gotten a lot better about that, but, like, he, he wants to go there. And I've asked it different ways, so he looks forward to it and um, – so it's been it's been huge, and honestly, it, you know, I would literally put Edelbrook in the almost too good to be true category. <laughs> and I'm not a cynic at all. You know, I'm not. I, I'm kind of if anything, I'm more of a rose-colored glasses guy. But um, but it's it's to me, you know, part of me is a little nervous. <laughs> like, um, I don't know what the availability is going to be. You know, how are you are they going to be able to continue to, to, to you know have my son come by? Because I I still think. I didn't know until like four months ago that um, I knew that we weren't paying out of pocket, but I, I didn't understand that how it worked. And I was like, oh my gosh. Like, so, so it wasn't even out of DDS's budget. So I just think it's phenomenal. And, and it, it seems also too, that from the beginning till now, 
the, um, I don't want to say this, the tenure, seniority, and experience of staff has increased from last fall till now. And I, I don't have any, you know, anything in writing that can confirm that. All I can say is eye to eye how I'm interacting with the folks. That's what I, my observation, you know, from, from when we started. Thank you, Jody. We, we really appreciate that feedback. It means a lot to us and we love having AJ. So I appreciate your time coming on here. You're welcome. All right. Am I, am I, am I good or did you have any other questions? <laughs> um, if you're going to, uh, well, first of all, thank you. And the reason that we have these forums is um, uh, we, I can share information from DDS perspective. Uh, Nicole can share information about the respite center, but honestly, where the rubber hits the road is for parents to hear from other parents. And when you talked about EJ saying, yeah, I want to go back, um, that to me is true respite. That's peace of mind. So thank you so much for uh, coming on and sharing your story. If you're not able to stay with us, uh, we do hold questions to the end, but um, if, if you need to sign up, um, we'll open it up to see if anybody has questions for Jody. Uh, before we continue on. And and I can't, I don't have my glasses on. Your name, ma'am? I'm sorry. I am Elisa Villardo. I'm Deputy Commissioner for DDS, and I host these forums each month. And really, uh, the goal is to share information. Um, and we always have individuals, family members, uh, share their experiences. And, and um, what I've heard, the feedback I've heard about these forums is that is the thing that really... Um, People back month after month is is these shared stories. So I really appreciate you taking the time. You're welcome. Connor, do we have any questions? Uh, let me take a look here. I don't see any deputy commissioner. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Jody. All right. Thank take you, care, Jody. Thanks Bye. for all you Jody. do. Appreciate Thank it. you. Um, Thanks, Jody. And I will share, I had the uh, opportunity to to, um, to visit the Linda Riley Blue Respite Center at the uh, ribbon cutting. And I could sit and, and sit at that century wall. I could uh, hang out uh, at, at that home. Um, respite is respite for the families, um, but I've seen again and again, it's also respite for the kids great to have a nice, uh, fun, safe place to go and enjoy a weekend. So thank you for everything uh, that you provide to the kids. And um, now I'm gonna turn it over to Jean Stack. Uh, Jean is um, our EDS Family Grant Manager and Jean is gonna share a little bit of information about our Family Grant Program. Hi everybody. Um, I just wanted to, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation either. I'm just kind of go, go through some information about um, family grants. So I kind of took the definition from our, you know, to be kind of technical. It's state funding awarded for the purpose of providing an individual and his or her family supports or defraying expenses related to the individ individual's disability. Um, that means a lot of different things to a lot of different families. We um, family grants can be used for a number of different things. We uh, we pay for adaptive equipment, assistive technology, camp, um, community activities, um, not food out in the community, but like an activity, you know, activities out with staff or things like that. Um, environmental modifications, individualized home supports. Um, we can pay for some services or medical services or items that are not covered by the insurance with a with documentation from the insurance company that it is not covered. We cover respite. That's probably the number one thing we get a request for with family grants is for respite. Um, for those that maybe times in between people going to the respite centers, um, getting a respite where they can hire someone to come in and just so maybe they can go grocery shopping or go somewhere overnight, that kind of thing. It's our number one thing that we get requests for. Um, we can also cover therapies that are, again, not covered by insurance with that documentation. So as I said, it's um, family grants are can cover a number of different things. And um, so we, and, and it's for those people that are, um, have been redetermined eligible for DDS. So those eight and above are the people that we get grants, you know, typically get grants requests for. Um, we do not, we are not able to cover typical childhood activities, but we can cover the disability related costs. And I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. Um, we have some 
um, say somebody was looking for getting their um, younger child uh, swimming lesson so that they're being, you know, for safety in the water. If a group lesson, say at the local Y, I'm just throwing numbers out there, is about $200. And for whatever reason that um, that child cannot participate in the group lessons, you say maybe it's too overwhelming sensory wise or something for them, and they need to have the one to one classes, and that's say $300, we will pay the $100 difference because that is the cost related to the person's disability. So those are things that we can do. We aren't going to pay for the whole overall swim lessons for our child, but we could pay for that disability related cost. Um, the what how it works is the case manager, you would call up your your case manager or the helpline and say, I have a request. I need, you know, we're going away for the weekend. I need, I need you to put in a request. They will send a they will fill out the request form and send it into the regional grant helpline because we're split up. Even though we're a centralized program, we um we service all three of the regions in the in the state. And what happens is they will ask you for some information because most of the time, and it doesn't have to be, but most of the time, the payee, who is the person who gets the money, is the parent. It can be an agency. It can be a company, depending on what you're looking for. Um, sometimes we get requests for like therapeutic horseback riding, and the company that provides that will be the payee themselves, and so they and then they'll bill us directly. So that it kind of takes the parent out of <laughs> out of the middle of it and having to worry about money and that kind of thing. Um, but the so usually it's a parent. A lot of times we see that so that. If don't be alarmed if they ask for you for your social security number, because that will be some information that we need because we have to go and check with the comptroller's office um, and make sure that we're paying the correct person based on the social security number. So that information is needed. Um, family grant funds are not taxable. Um, we don't report anything to the IRS. It's money if, as you as the payee, if you were the person to get them the funds, it's not income for you because you're not keeping it. You're paying out for services. So that's why it's not taxable. Um, a parent or guardian cannot be the person providing the respite. So you couldn't, somebody couldn't get the money and pay the mom to take care of her child or, or vice versa. Um, and the person, and even if it was somebody different, if it wasn't a parent, um, they can't be, you know, like, let's say you have, you're going to use, say, a, you know, an aunt or something, but that person can't be the payee. They can't pay themselves. You would have to get the money and pay them. Um, if that makes sense. And the person providing the service must be at, at least 18 years old. They can live in the same home as the individual, but they have to be, again, can't be the parent or guardian, and um, they have to be over the age of 18. Um, let's see. So we talked about, um, yeah, contacting your case manager. They would fill it out. We meet every two weeks to review grants. There's a committee. There's um, six people plus myself on the committee, and we split it. So every two weeks that we meet, there's three people and three people, and there's there's two people on the total committee from each region at representation. There's case managers and case management supervisors. Um, and requests are normally for a three month period. So you put it in for say 13 weeks or three months. And the reason that we do that is so that we make sure that we are um, we get our allotments of funding on a three months um, as three month allotment. So we do that we kind of keep everybody to that three months so that we have enough money to act, to fund everybody that comes for a grant in that three months. Um, and then once the we meet and do the approval, we'll send you out a packet and it has an approval and agreement so that you, it would say, you know, for example, there was, you know, a thousand dollars for respite that was approved. And so you would read over the agreement and then sign and date it and then send it back to us. And once we get the agreement back, we would send that to our business office for processing, and that's when how you would get the funding. Um, and we send up a we send up a batch to them every two weeks. I'm sorry, every week on a, usually like a Friday afternoon. So that's you know, and then from there it's usually a two week turnaround. So if you sent it up to us on a Friday, we sent it off to the business office. It's usually about a two week turnaround. Um, you will see information from us about direct deposit. Um, which does include a tax form. It's a W-9. Again, it's not, we're not reporting it to anybody. It's just a, a form required from the comptroller's office, but you are not required to do direct deposit. We're just providing you the information should you like to, should you be interested in, in using that, that feature, but you're not required to. Um, and we will only send you that paperwork once. And if you decide to, great. And if you don't, then that's fine too. And then once you've received your funding, once you've paid out for your services, there's a log that you would keep. If you're, let's say, for example, you have that money for respite. Every time that person comes and works with your child or individual, 
Um, you're going to have them fill out the log. They were here from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. I paid them $20 an hour. I, you know, it was this much money. And they sign off, yes, I worked those hours and I received that money. And then you're keeping track of it so you know. And then when you're done with the funding, we have an expenditure report and um, like a form that you sign and say, yes, I spent the money on for respite, this much money. And you send that form back with the logs and then we would look it over and if everything's all set and it all matches up then we would close out your grant um, and you are at that point eligible for another grant should you need one but one of them has to be and the grant has to be closed up before another one can be requested um, and then we have a couple other things if there's an ex so students that are involved with extended school year no matter whether you decide not to participate in extended school year, we cannot provide services. If your school system has um, set aside funding for that individual, whether you participate or not, we cannot pay for any services that take place during the extended school year, just to, just so that you're aware. So if you're setting up camp and most of the extended school years are in July, you know, for the whole month of July, I would suggest setting up camp maybe before July or in August because we cannot cover camp that would be taking place during that same time. Um, if there's things that you need help, uh, like an environmental modification or medical equipment or anything, things that are over, if it, the cost is over $2,500, we need three bids from three comparable companies, just to kind of put that out there to you if you're thinking about something like that. Um, if for some reason you, let's say you get a grant for respite and you're having a very hard time finding a staff and you really don't wanna return the money, you think you could be find something else that you could use it for, like let's say, for example, therapeutic horseback riding or something like that. If you wanted to do a what we call a change of use, you would email me and say, you know, I have this $300 left. I'd really like to use it for therapeutic horseback riding since I can't find it. My staff quit or whatever it was. And then I will send it up to the committee and we'll send you the information about that. Um, there's, I just have one more thing before I finish. We did get funding from the State Department of Education also, which was fantastic. Um, we were able to spend money and we still have a little bit left and we're hoping that maybe we'll be able to get some more from them too. But it was really great to be able to help out families that were looking for things. Um, like we had started off doing virtual learning, but then that kind of went to the wayside. So we were able to provide funding for before and after school programs at a facility. Therapy is not covered by insurance, tutoring um, and educational enrichment programs, community activities vocational employment support during the summers and then other summer programs like like camps. Um, that program is a little bit different because it's not our, our own funding. So it's a reimbursement program. So you would have to provide, um, you'd have to pay for the service and have to have it take place. And then we would be able to reimburse you. Whereas our regular family grant funds, though that funding is given to you upfront, but it's not our funding. And that's how it was set up with the State Department of Education. So. That is how family grants run. I know I threw a ton of information at you, sorry, but um, it's just, just think of it as a way of, you know, for different needs that you have about being able to have us help kind of offset some of those costs. So, and Jean, I, we have a you, parent too. Jean, Oops, sorry. can you talk about um, who can apply for a grant and the priorities of a grant? Yes, so um, we have a prioritization when we do grants, so, we, the people that we look at first are the people who have no services. Those are normally the, the people that are still un, under the LEA. They're, um, they don't have any services from DDS yet. And then the next group we look at is the day program, people who have a day program. And then we have people that look that are have day and res services. And then our last group that we look at is what we call our non-determined kids. Those are kids that are in the system that have not been redetermined eligible for DDS yet. So they are the lowest priority just because they haven't, we haven't gotten that redetermination yet, but it doesn't mean that they can't apply for a grant. It just means they're the very lowest priority. So we have a parent too here, um, Elisa, that would like, that was willing to come on and, and talk about. Thank you her. so much, Jean. And Liz, are you here with us? I saw Liz, her name. I saw her name before on. Um... Liz, are you able to come on camera? Dean, do you see if Liz is on the participant list? I'm looking, but I don't see her name. I saw her on here before, but I'm not sure what happened. Let me see if she sent me 
an email or something. No, I don't have an email from her, but she was on here before. I did see her name come up. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, what we can do, you teed it up perfectly. Let me see if I can get in touch with her. Okay. And then what we're going to do is we're going to um, move on to talk a little bit about Camp Quinnebog. And um, if Liz is able to join us, we'll um, cycle back. Oh, somebody's in the lobby. Um, but I don't think it's Liz. All right. So at this point, I'm going to uh, invite uh, Sue Paul and Emily Pudva to join us. Sue, are you with us? We're here. Okay. Now, We're our, because there's no uh, internet up here in the quiet corner currently. Heroic efforts and uh, great flexibility. Uh, Putnam has lost in, uh, has lost internet co connectivity, and Emily and uh, Sue are joining us uh, via iPhone. And if you can, um, we we can see just half of each of you. Um, what we're going to do is Gunner is going to call. Hello, welcome. Um, so Sue and Emily are going to talk a little bit about Camp Quinnebog. I happily like to call Camp Quin Quinnebog the, the happiest place on earth. Um, it's where I've had so many um, wonderful uh, times and, and, um, and you'll see why in a bit. So Gunner, if you can um, call the presentation up. I will turn it over to Sue and Emily. Thank so you. I'm probably going to do most of the talking because Emily has lost her voice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so she's training now um, because I've retired and it's I we both felt it was really important for her to be here so you could see her and, and uh, she could see all of you, of course, and, and learn more about, you know, everything that's Camp Q. So uh, Camp Q is a free camp. Um, it's been existence, in existence since 1972, and we are in uh, Danielson, Connecticut, and uh, we are on 11 acres of land, and we have the only beach on that uh, body of water. Um, every year, we, are, we have typically non-COVID years. We provide camp services to ages 4 through the 22nd birth date. Um, to um, about 90 to 120 campers. Um, we work closely uh, with the area schools who for out of the 120, we probably have 100 paras that come to help facilitate uh, the camp for each of the campers. Um, we do provide activities that include swimming, boating, fishing, nature enrichment, arts and crafts, sports, history, science, um, you can go to the next slide, actually, so you can read along with me. Um, socializing and forming mean meaningful relationships, all within a fully handicapped accessible summer camp. Our camp is barrier free. Of course, we're outdoors and that helps to promote personal growth and foster independence for children and young adults with disabilities. Um, we have medical and social supports necessary for campers who might otherwise be excluded from a residential camp setting or I'm sorry, not residential, recreational. We're just a day camp. Um, campers are encouraged to try new experiences and gain self-confidence, learn cooperation, appropriate communication, and increase personal independence in a safe and fun environment. Often many of our campers form new and long lasting friendships. It's really something to see. Um, camp is a very special place to all of us, but especially for the kids that come. Um, they want to just be themselves and focus on their abilities instead of their disabilities. Camp Q provides a sense of freedom in an environment where anything is possible. Camp is a place of yes, I can. <clears throat> Our campers often do not want camp to end. Um, that we offer them a week of alumni uh, experience. So the campers who've aged out of our program, we have them come back for a week and they help us get things set up and have that one, one more time at camp. Um, uh, and often when they come back, um, they, uh, even before they age out, um, you know, as they mature through the program, um, they come back and they like to have an opportunity to help other campers and, and have a supporting role. Um, the veteran campers realize the benefits and enjoy teaching new campers about the magic that is Camp Q. Um, we typically, um, on a year that's good for hiring staff, we have two LPNs that are on board, two lifeguards, four directors, and the directors include uh, the camp director, the waterfront director, the boating director, and the assistant director. 
those positions are all covered by DDS. Um, we also have 11 counselors that we typically hire um, in a non-COVID situation. And those positions are paid for uh, by our nonprofit board, which is the Friends of Camp Q. DDS also covers two specialized counselors, which are arts and crafts and sports and nature. And sometimes we have the opportunity to hire a groundskeeper, which is a big help as well. So here you see some of our pictures um, celebrating Independence Day and uh, two little guys who uh, met for the first time and became fast friends. You can uh, forward. Some more pictures, some outdoor fun. Swimming and boating are a big part of Camp Q. Okay. Um, so on the left circle is the Discovery Bus that comes every Monday. Um, it's literally a school bus that was turned into a library and the kids can go in and read. Uh, they can borrow books and bring them back the following week. Um, uh, we have a story time. Someone comes and reads um, a story to a group. Uh, at one, one year, we had a local politician who came for a visit and she volunteered to be the reader for that day. So that was something very special. Um, in the middle is the Olympic ceremony. We, we, we do um, Camp Q version of the Olympics. It's very creative and very fun. Um, and then on the right is a carnival clown. Um, one of our uh, camp directors loves to be in costume and the kids love it too. So any opportunity he can to, to entertain, it's uh, always a pleasure. Okay, um, we have the guy on the left who caught um, a, I believe that is a pumpkin something fish. I don't, I don't know my fish, <laughs> but I think that is. Um, and then we have uh, some folks in the swimming area on a surfboard and then uh, the canoe crew on the right. Okay. Um, last year we did the Camp Q version of Cinderella it was very special. Um, we were so pleased with how it turned out. Um, the campers did not disappoint. We have a, um, a private program on grounds on camp, a private day program. And they came and participated as the audience. And we served popcorn and juice. And um, it was really, a, a, really a magical time. Um, the kids got so into it. So did we. <laughs> OK. Um, then we also had a prom. Um, so for many of the kids, uh, you, you know, they don't go to prom, so we thought it would be a nice opportunity for them. Um, they got to choose what they wanted to be, a king or a queen. Um, they got to make their own crowns. Uh, they got to make their own sashes, and they got to dress up however they wanted for that day. And we, of course, we had a lot of music and dancing and food. It was a really fun time. Okay, next. Um, this, more pictures of the prom. You'll see some of them have masks on because it was still during COVID times. Okay. And this is, uh, so by the time this came up, I could only get one week, which was alumni. So these, these are some highlights of alumni week. Campers who come back. We even have a couple of counselors who are not able to return to camp to work for the seven weeks of summer. So they come during alumni week and volunteer their time because they don't like to let it go either. And that's it. So thank you so much, Sue. And uh, very nice to meet you, Emily. Hope you get your voice back soon. Um, and you can see why uh, Camp Q is, is one of the happiest places on earth. Um, the, uh, Sue is very gracious and I hope Emily will continue to be uh, to send me these pictures throughout the year. And I have uh, to the left of my desk is uh, all of my Camp Q photographs, but uh, um, there's just the kids experience such joy and it's it's really a, a wonderful, wonderful camp. So thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm going to check bro. back and see if Jody has joined us. Lisa, I was able, able to get Liz to come back on. She was Liz, she oh, got I'm off and then got back in. So she's, I'm sorry. she's on. Liz, are you able to come on camera? Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yay, Welcome. okay. Thanks for having me. Um, I have an 11 year old son uh, who's been supported by DDS for maybe the last three years. 
Um, quite honestly, I didn't really know much about DDS and the family grant until another family introduced um, it to me. So for us, the main challenge not only is his intellectual disability, but is some of his medical needs. And so I've never allowed anybody to come and help with respite because he's a challenge. However, um, with the DDS family grant, I have let my guard down a little bit and have allowed some help to come into my home and more importantly um, assist with some of his summer camps that he goes to so for right now he's going to the therapeutic horseback riding camp that has been discussed earlier and I was allowed to pay for um, a support person to go with him as part of the DDS family grant in years past I've had to go by myself with him and I work full time and it just wasn't feasible. Um, so I'm very grateful for the fact that he can attend these camps um, and we're not in ESY right now. So that's why we're able to do them last week and this week. And I'm also able to pay somebody to go with him and to keep him safe and provide me some respite so I can continue working during the day. So that's been a, a huge benefit to us. Um, we also take advantage of some of the other programs like um, a bike camp that um, we attend that's put on by the Miracle League. And the Miracle League is one of the vendors that DDS works with. And so they pay the Miracle League directly for the one week of summer camp. Um, and so for us, it's mostly around camps um, in the summer as well as respite throughout the year. But it's been a tremendous help. And I have been the payee of the grant. And so I manage who I have come in and provide the services. And I filled out the logs and submitted them um, at the end of a grant cycle. It's very easy, um, self-explanatory. Uh, so for us, it's been a no-brainer and it's been extremely helpful. And I know Owen's very grateful for the opportunities he has to be more independent and to do things like other kids normally do. Thank you so much, Liz. Um, My pleasure. It's helpful to hear, and Jean had explained uh, the process, but to hear from a family perspective that, um, that the paperwork associated is manageable and easy to follow is really, is really helpful to hear. Um, thank you for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. All right, um, so our final two presentations for today are gonna talk a little bit about um, transition transition from school to work. And um, I will introduce um, Brian Smith uh, from DDS and Stephanie Knight um, from uh, the Bureau of Rehab Services that are going to um, uh, tag team to talk about a school to work transition. Welcome. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm hoping people can see that. Stephanie can just nod her head that it's a go. All right, perfect. We're Thank good. you, Stephanie. Go team. So welcome this afternoon. You guys are all in the home stretch. Only two of us left to go. So we're going to try to make this as fun and enjoyable as possible. Lots of information already shared today, but there's more to come. So transitioning from school to work is a conversation that I'm going to have, and then I'm going to hand it off and share a presentation um, in collaboration with my colleague, Stephanie Knight, from the Bureau of Rehabilitation Services. So what is transition? You know, the Oxford Dictionary defines transition as the process or a period of changing from one state or condition to another, and in this case, students in transition from one program to another. Young adults transition how many times through the educational process? They go from home by birth to three, into the school system, into elementary school, right? And then from elementary to middle, middle to high, high to adult life. So there's a number of different transitions that do occur for each and every youth who go through our educational system. Some key important things to know when you go through transition, whether you are supporting somebody, you're a family member, or you're an individual on the call today who's going through this. Individuals who are leaving LEA, which is a local education agency, supports are leaving an entitlement-based services under the IDEA, and you'll be entering in eligibility-based supports. So eligibility is determined by each and every one of our state agencies. There's not one golden eligibility key for every single agency, right? So there's none, possibly multiple applications, but depending on who you're connected with, those applications can go very easily. 
Um, ensure state agencies appropriate to the individual's transition from school to adult services are identified and eligibility pursued and the promotion of participation in PPTs. It's really critical that we work in collaboration with each student to whatever extent we are physically able to because there's so many students every year and so many PPTs, but being engaged early helps us along helps us with that planning along those very critical transition years. Now we're dipping down to 16 on up. And there's talks, we've had some talks with some families as young as 14 about transition planning so they can get ahead of that process and that, that typical transition age. And as it goes right into plan early, the students should work with school educators and transition staff, state agency personnel and community employers and providers on a person-centered exit plan. It's, it's critical that the student is actively involved in this process and has a voice as to what direction they'd like to go. It pulled some slides out of some of our other presentations um, that are available. Um, I will say this, uh, I can go back and share my contact information, but I do help coordinate all our transition advisors uh, within DDS. There's nine current positions within the Family Support Division, um, and we do road trips, so real road shows. So if you have a parent group, a, a provider, um, a school system, whether it be four parent groups or four professionals or another family organization, we would be happy to come out and kind of give you a DDS 101 all about transition. Or if it's a younger age group, we'll tailor the conversation to the younger age. But this slide and the next couple come right out of some of that PowerPoint presentation itself. These here are some of those transition tasks that we really, really push. And it says beginning at age 18, but that mind, you have to start thinking about these things even before then. Um, connecting with your DDS transition advisor. Uh, we do, as I mentioned, have nine. They each have their geographic coverage areas. Um, as Tanya early on mentioned, we have three regions, north, south, and west. So each there's three in each, and they each have their geographic um, coverage. Be happy to direct you to the right person if you have any questions on that. Um, so get in touch with them early. Have a conversation with them. They are a fantastic resource to the students and families and school districts and work in collaboration with our friends at BRS as well and other state agencies. Exploring decision making options with probate court. Guardianship is not for everybody. There's a host of different options out there depending on the individual. Um, so do your due diligence, research, what options are there and what aligns with my loved one, my students or the individual's uh, needs with, with, with respect to legal decision making. So explore all those. We'd be happy to, again, help you and direct you to some appropriate resources for some of that um, research. Applying for supplemental security income at 18. Um, applying for Connecticut Medicaid, Husky C. I heard that earlier in one of the presentations, one of the speakers, very critical. Um, connecting with BRS, um, each school district does have a level up counselor assigned to them. At times they might have vacancies like we all do, um, but each district does have a, a assigned level up counselor for them. Get in touch with them, have the transition staff at school, make that connection for the student um, and have them a part of that uh, conversation at the table about employment and the different services that the school and level up offers. Really, really important, photo ID. Get the non-driver's license for those who are not pursuing a driver's license. Right through DMV, it's very cost effective. And if you're definitely doing the employment track, which we highly encourage, photo ID is a, a critical piece of documentation for job applications. Um, and we all learned the lesson through recently with COVID and the vaccines having to show some kind of form of ID when going to get vaccinated. So kind of reinforce the need for having that. And now with the online registration for those uh, any DMV activities for that matter. Um, it makes life so much easier just by go, doing it with an appointment rather than standing in those uh, very lengthy lines in the past. Registering to vote at 18, that is uh, a right for all parties who do turn the age of 18, and we encourage that consideration as well. You'll see that there is a, a transition timeline of uh, document that's available both in English and Spanish on our website. Um, that's a nice little checkbox that you can walk through a host of different transition related activities. And it does give you some of those timeframes of by when or when you should start considering some of those activities. What is the role of our DDS transition advisor as we speak today? 
um, to assist students, families, school systems, adult service agencies, and DDS case managers alike. Yes, we do. They do help our case managers out too, and navigating a, a bunch of different things, and planning a student's transition from school to adult life. They help collaborate with other state agencies, as I mentioned, to ensure that all transition options are explored and presented to students and families and school systems for consideration. Collaborate with providers of adult services to ensure that students, families, and the school systems become knowledgeable about the various employment and day supports that are available. Um, so as you can see, they do play a critical role in making sure that a lot of that information, they are the conduit of information between all those key stakeholders around that student who's going to be exiting school. Um, and those conversations start early. They don't start at three months or six months before they exit school. They start in advance of that. For those who might not know, we, DDS is an employment first uh, state, so we are we do really, really focus in on the messaging around employment, which is in part why Stephanie is joining us today, because we have a great collaboration with them right now. Um, real work for real pay. So the principles around everyone can work and there's a job for everybody. Um, not working should, not, should be the exception. Uh, we really push the conversation of employment. Starting that conversation earlier gets people thinking creatively and how we can make that uh, an actual option on the table for many students. Starting the conversation later does um, create complications in some of that planning. So the earlier, the better with respect to planning and starting the conversations. Uh, people are healthier, safe, and happiest when, with meaningful work. Uh, true employment is not a social service. Employment is a win-win for everybody, and et cetera. The link there also does afford an opportunity for you to just click and go right to our website, right to the Employment and Day Services page on our website at this time. Next up, I just want to talk really quickly about how, you know, if you are connected with DDS and you do get annualized resources when um, your family member or you exit school, um, you can purchase supports through a traditional provider. And I saw a couple names from a variety of different providers in our um, participant list. So thank you for joining. So there is a link in that uh, slide as well. That'll bring you right to the active qualified provider list. Um, so that is one option. You can talk to agency XYZ and talk to them about the various supports that they do offer. And if they are in your media geography, um, so where your home is, they might be the solution, but there might be others for consideration too. So again, working with the transition advisor helps you with that. The other big option is our self-direction. Um, a lot of families through COVID, based on staffing issues and considerations, have chosen to do a lot more self-direction of their supports. So there, that is another option in our service system where you can be, or somebody, a designee, can become employer of record. Um, and help coordinate services and supports around the individual through a self-directed way and not work with a traditional provider agency. So there's a couple different ways that you can use the resources from DDS, purchase the supports that he or she may need while on the job, or if a job is not the current pathway for them in a traditional um, adult day program is right out the gate, um, then we can help you coordinate those as well. The last slide is just a bunch of links around those state agencies that I talked about around some of those critical things. Um, and now I'm going to hand it over to Stephanie Knight. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, and she, and with a little bit of me, is going to talk about an amazing uh, pilot program, work-based learning opportunity um, that we have been pushing for the past couple months and speaking to some um, selected school districts. So Stephanie. Thank you, Brian. Let me just share my screen. I think you can all see this. So as Brian was as Brian was saying, we are here to talk about an early intervention pilot program that is a collaboration between the Bureau of Rehabilitation Services and the Department of Developmental Services. Um, we are piloting this school dis this pilot in nine identified school districts. Um, one of the reasons we decided to do this pilot is right now BRS is serving individuals um, with pre-employment transition services approximately two years prior to exit, but we realized that early intervention is clearly needed around these services, and so we want to start offering level-up services 
earlier and more often to students with intellectual disabilities so that they and their families can make more informed choices around post-secondary options, including competitive integrated employment. So rather than starting two years prior to exit from the LEA, this pilot is looking to start serving individuals uh, between the ages of 17 and 19 years old. We chose three school districts per region. One is urban, one is suburban, and one is rural. We decided to do this in consultation with our DDS transition advisors, and we tried to pick school districts that were really doing transition services in the middle of the road. So not someone, not a school district that was, you know, barely meeting the minimum and not a school district that was hitting it out of the park. Um, starting this summer, we are gonna start offering services to the identified school districts. Um, some of these services will be offered during ESY hours and some will be offered outside of ER ESY hours. Our plan is to start small. We're gonna offer four services this summer, meeting individuals where they're at. So for some individuals, they may just participate in Job Club, which is a 12 hour service where we just start talking about work and some of those vital work readiness skills. For other individuals, they may do a group job shadow where they go out to a work site and they see what it's like to do that particular job. They talk to individuals who work at that job um, just to get a feel for it. We're also offering career exploration using virtual reality goggles. This is done on the same platform that most gaming is done on. We're using the Oculus goggles through Transfer VR, um, which allows individuals to get immersed into work environments without leaving the classroom or without leaving one of our community rehabilitation provider sites. Um, another thing that we are offering this summer is work-based learning opportunities where individuals will get the opportunity to actually go out and work on a job site and earn minimum wage for the hours that they work. Work-based learning opportunities can be as little as 40 hours and up to 120 hours. In addition to all of that, we are looking to enhance services after the summer, so the next school year, 2023, 2024, and we'll be looking to include services around life skills, self-advocacy, um, and a lot more. Hang on, trouble moving slides, there we go. Um, we also understand how vital benefits are to the individuals that both BRS and DDS serve. A lot of the services I talked about will not impact benefits because the student will not be earning a wage. However, for those students who are considering a work-based learning experience, they will be earning a wage. So if any of those individuals are receiving social security benefits, we will ensure a meeting happens with one of our benefits counselors prior to starting the work-based learning experience so students and families understand how work can and or will affect any social security benefits, including Medicaid and Medicare. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Brian. So, DRS has its limitations. The school system has its limitations. But in partnership with DDS, what we've decided to do is look at each youth who's participating in this pilot program who has diagnosis of intellectual disability and eligible for DDS services who's participating. We're going to be looking at how we can support that youth. So if they do need some assistance getting to a particular service because it's falling without outside the parameters of the responsibilities of BRS and or the school system, um, or they might need somebody to be with them. We are committed to looking at how we can support the expenses associated with that so that that student can attend and participate actively. So if you're in one of those nine districts or if we get through this pilot program, um, that is going to be a service option um, that we are committed to to seeing the success for each of those students. So again, individualized focus on that. It's not going to be a broad stroke of everybody gets this and everybody gets that. We are going to really look at, at what Brian needs 
with, with respect to getting to that particular service option that BRS is offering through the pilot program, does the LEA per have any level of responsibility? If not, okay, what can DDS do? So definitely we'll be uh, working in collaboration, all these behind the scenes, I'm trying to make that happen and how we're gonna fund it so that it doesn't become uh, a barrier to that student's success. And then our pilot timeline. Um, for all of the identified school districts, um, with the exception of maybe one or two, we have held um, meetings with students and their families and are working on enrolling students in the BRS Level Up program. Um, and DDS will be providing um, resource guidance as, as Brian had said. Um, our goal is to begin providing services to students this summer. So starting in July, we do have some job clubs already set up and we're working on setting up some work-based learning experiences for um, some of those students as well. Um, if you are in one of these school districts um, and your student is between the ages of 17 and 19 and you haven't been able to attend one of our parent meetings, please feel free to reach out to us after the presentation um, so that we can look at getting your individual connected. In addition, if you, as Brian said, if you do have a student that um, is starting the transition process, BRS Level Up services are available and we can work on getting them connected to that as well. Um, and then BRS is going to track students who enter the pilot and follow them through their transition years. So this isn't just a pilot we're running this summer. This isn't just a pilot that will maybe run in the fall. This pilot is going to follow these students until they exit their LEA so that we can see um, if they enroll in BRS services prior to graduation, um, and if they end up in a competitive integrated employment opportunity so that we can show whether or not early intervention does make a difference. And I think most of us on this call will say, yes, it will make a difference. And that is it. Thank you so much, Stephanie and Brian. I, I must say, um, this was just an idea like six months ago and the work that has gone into identifying the school districts and and reaching out and and putting together this pilot has been um, really just impressive and i'm incredibly hopeful that this the, the learning from this pilot year will benefit um, students from for years to come hopefully we'll be able to expand it in the future so thank you both for your work on this Welcome. And that concludes our formal uh, presentations. I've been keeping my eye on the chat. I haven't seen any questions uh, coming uh, come in uh, through the chat. Um, so I'll open it up if anyone wants to raise their hand or if um, if uh, you do have a, a question and you'd like to put it in the chat, um, we'll give an opportunity uh, now. And we're seeing some feedback. Sounds like a great pilot uh, and uh, appreciation for the, uh, the last presentation. So thank you. Are there any questions? Deputy Commissioner, I don't see any questions or hands raised. All right, thank you, Kevin. All right. Um, so we will end a little early today. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, give us a day or two and we'll get the um, presentation up on our website. As I mentioned, it's on the, the home screen if you look under Fourth Tuesday Forums. Um, and I appreciate everyone joining us today. Take care and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.